Okay, let's take a moment to uh, settle ourselves and begin our prayers. Please be seated for the reading of God's Word. We're, reading, we're using the epistle today, um, the letter of James, so a reading from the letter of James. James, the servant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who generously gives to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower, for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms falls, and the beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even when they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Take my lips, O Lord, and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Welcome this morning. Glad to see everybody here. Today we begin a new series of sermons on the epistle of James. If I were to give a subtitle to this epistle, I would call it a manual for practical Christianity. Practical Christianity. And this is in conjunction with the theme of our stewardship program, which is entitled Acts of Love. Acts of Love. All of us should be able to identify with the thought, we are always asking everything to be made practical. I admonish to use the KISS principle. Anybody know what the KISS principle is? Keep it simple. Steve. Keep it simple, Steve. Right? (laughs) Right? That's the one, right? Okay, we got that one. Okay, I got to keep it simple. Good. (laughs) There is a sense that the Epistle of James is a how-to book. In any bookstore with a large selection of such books, from how to build a patio to how to repair your motorcycle, we'll have practical books. We have just become a practical do-it-yourself people. How many of you people do it yourself? Let's see. Yeah, look at, there they are. Okay, but there are many people who can afford to have everything and anything done by others, but they prefer to do it themselves also. Okay, there's a lot of rich people out there that said, I'd rather do it myself, thank you. The Epistle of James is a kind of how-to manual for the Christian life. I find it appealing, don't you? How to? I like the answers. We hear a lot in church about what we should do, but perhaps not enough about how we should do it. My prayer is that throughout this series, we will not forget the how-to for our theme for the stewardship this year, which is Acts of Love. And it's based upon John 15, 12. Love one another as I have loved you. Let's say all that, let's say that together. Acts of Love. Love one another as I have loved you. Easy to say, difficult to do, right? Let's, we're all going to work on that. I'm going to work on that. I believe James is a book that we are well advised to read and to understand. Its purpose is not to proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, but contains wisdom and guidance for those who would be followers of our risen Lord. It's an instruction book. It's great. It helps us out. In fact, some have even thought that it was a community, a commentary in sections of the Sermon on the Mount. James was there, he heard the Sermon on the Mount, and he was commenting on those. 
Throughout the letter, you'll find words of James that sound very much like the words of Jesus. I like to think of James as a manual for discipleship and stewardship, or I said earlier, a manual for practical Christianity. We are going to take five Sundays to move through this series, ending October 11th, with a sermon from our new bishop, Bishop Peter Eaton, who will be here for that entire weekend. And I talk about celebrations. It's going to be a wonderful time here, and I hope you all get involved in that, and uh, there's going to be a dinner, and there's going to be a lot of other things going on. Our approach is going to be centered on the hard but easily broken powerful truths that occur one after another in this epistle. There's a lot of meat in here, and we've got to take it apart and see what we have. Some believe that the epistle was originally a sermon or sermons preached by James, the brother of our Lord, and then recorded in this fashion. In fact, there was one theory of authorship which has it that the sermon was preached by James in the aromatic tongue, taken down by someone who translated it into impeccable Greek, then edited it, judiciously added a few things with love and care, and then gave it to the whole church at large. We're going to center on the points James the preacher made, elaborate on them, and then apply them to our own lives. In the body of the epistle, it starts in, with a shout in verse 2, which says, Consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy. There's a difference between happiness and joy, right? Think about that, okay? There's no hesitation here. There's no fumbling to get the point, to get to the point. We don't have any deflated footballs here this morning. There's no tipping toes around thorny issues. You can tell where I, where I vote for. <laughs> What's the first thorny issue that James addresses in today's reading? Suffering, trials, troubles, all those flies in the ointment, and all those thorns in the flesh, all those knockdowns in life, all those push back to the goal line and make it us start again. That's where James began, and he shouts with considerate, pure joy. Well, James gets our attention right off. He gets our attention by grabbing our shoulders, shaking us, looking us straight in the eye, and with a steady voice, hones in, consider it pure joy. James deserves our hearing, so let's listen to him this morning. What are the lessons that we find here? The first lesson is elementary, but we tend to forget it. Growth is not easy. Growth is not easy. Now that sounds so simplistic that I want to say it again so that you will know that I mean it for you to take it seriously. Growth is not easy. That is true of any kind of growth. It isn't easy. It is especially true of Christian growth. That's the reason we have so, so few truly saintly people. And that's the reason why we should be slow to judge the faith and commitment of others. So much for our growth, and so much for the way we express our faith, dependent upon the kind of people we are, and we are all, all very, very different. There's a witness today. We have a witness in your pamphlet, and the witness today would be Sally Hastings, who many of us know and love. And Sally wrote this thing entitled, entitled God's Blessing. I don't, how many of you read that already? Oh, good, then none of you heard it. That's good. Put your hands down, quick. Here's what Sally says to us. It was the summer of 2003. Michael and I had been cruising in our sailboat in the Bahamas, always looking for that right Florida town to call home. We did not know how much our prayers would be answered when we dropped hook in Stewart. Having not owned a car or home for three years, we started settling in, even finding quaint St. Mary's Chapel. It was the end of one of those majestic, majestic Sunday services that Father David invited everyone in need to attend a 5 p.m. healing service that night. I had been wrestling with my drinking habits. Alcoholism was in my family, and this addiction haunted me. I knew alcoholism is a disease, and this healing service fascinated me enough to go. Still living on our boat, I dinghied ashore and drove to the church. When it was time to come forward, I wanted to pray my prayer partner to be Father David. I figured that was the most direct route to the big guy. Well, that did not happen, but my prayer partners did a superb job of getting my disease to care for God, asking him to remove my obsession. At the end of the service, one of my prayer partners congratulated me. He told me he went to Alcoholics Anonymous and asked if he could escort me to a meeting. 
Well, that was just the start of my journey to a sober life. It's been 12 short years. We now know that God was at the helm of our boat and at St. Mary's the path to a more spiritual life in God's hands. We feel blessed by our St. Mary's family. I am thankful every day for my new life in sobriety. Sally's testimony is a powerful witness to the ministry that occurs and continues to occur at St. Mary's. There's a saying that I found on the internet this morning. It says, be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Let me repeat that. I, I love that. I, 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 it was like 3 o'clock in the morning. And I was taking care of Pat, and I just looked at Facebook, and this came up. Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. How many of you agree with that? Pretty unanimous, isn't it, huh? Okay. None of us knows the other person's personal struggles. We sometimes think we do, but more often than not, we, what we perceive is far from reality. Now, I've never been a drinking man, so I can't begin to, begin to understand the struggles of an alcoholic. So we need to be careful about judging others. We need to know what there may be going on inside that other person, driving them to their actions and attitudes. If we are not willing to be patient with people and stick with them until they are free to share their inner struggles with us, we can at least not add to their burden by judging them. Growth is not easy, and so much of our growth, so much of the way we express our faith is dependent upon the kind of people we are, and we are all very different. That brings me to a second truth that he gives us this morning. When you are suffering, it doesn't help to compare yourself with others. Let me say that one more time. When you are suffering, it does not help to compare yourself with others. How many of us do that? I certainly do. Yes. Over 200 years ago, there was a young boy who lived in England who was very sick and puny. They didn't have the kind of medicine back then that we have today. They weren't blessed with the medical technology that we have now. And so all of his life he remained in that condition and never became physically a physically strong person. When he was young, he would look out the window of his house and watch other children playing in the field. He would get sad and watch them at times, even crying, because he wanted to be out there with him. But he couldn't, and that made him feel sorry for himself. He was jealous and envious of others, especially other young people. When he got older, he decided that he would go into the ministry, be a pastor of a congregation, and spend his life serving Christ in that way. But again, his health failed, and he was just too frail to carry on his pastoral duties, and then he became deeply depressed. Why can't I be like other people, he cried out. They've got their health and I don't. They can do things with their lives and I can't. They're all out there making a difference, and I'm just sitting here unable to make a difference, any difference at all. Why can't I be just like them? Then one day, someone talked with this young man and helped him to see that his life had its, has, had its own purpose, apart from that of anyone else. So he began to realize that he would get nowhere as so long as he compared himself with everyone else. He had his own life to live, apart from that of anyone else. And what mattered was that he lived his own life fully and completely into the very best of his own ability. When he did that, his life really began to take off. You see, that man was no other than Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts, one of the greatest hymn writers of all time. Isaac was the one who wrote, Joy to the World, and Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past. But it didn't happen for him until he quit looking around, comparing himself with others, and committed himself to living his own unique life. So if we are going to learn how to count all our joy, move through our suffering and trials to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, we need to know that it doesn't help to compare ourselves with others. That brings us to a specific word in our text, suffering. The word suffering can be wasted or it can reduce steadfastness and faith. That's what James says in the verse today. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And James concludes in verse 4, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature, not lacking in anything. 
You see, suffering may produce perseverance and faith, but it may still be incomplete. We still may lack joy. Pain by itself is evil. It doesn't teach us anything. It may discipline us to be strong and not complain, or it may turn us into a cynics. We may be tough and steadfast in our suffering, always keeping a stiff upper lip, but that's a long way from what James is talking about. Consider it pure joy that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. There's another story about two brothers who were watching the circus parade, but they can't watch from a different perspective. How many of you like circuses here? How many kids? Anybody here like circuses? How many of you remember when you were young that the circus used to come into town? And what did it do? How did it come in? A big parade, right? Okay, and you'd sit there and you'd watch the whole parade go by. Well, one, one of the boys was looking through a hole in the fence. He was looking through it. How many of you ever looked through a hole in the fence? If you've ever been to Boston or one of these big cities and they're having construction, they put these little peak holes so you can see what's going on inside, right? Okay, he was looking through the hole in the fence. First he saw the ringmaster go by, and then a clown. Then he saw a ferocious tiger, and he jumped to the conclusion that the tiger would eat the ringmaster and the clown. The problem was that he was looking through a little hole in the fence. He couldn't see the big picture. He, could remember, he couldn't see that the tiger was in a cage. He couldn't see that the ringmaster and clown, clown were protected from any danger. The other brother could see it all. He stood on the roof of a large building looking down on the whole parade. He saw the big picture and he knew that everything was in order. James knew that without the big picture perspective towards our lives, our tendency would be to count our problems rather than to count it all joy. As Christians, we are called not to try to avoid our problems, but to face them, learn from them, and turn the rest over to Christ. There's an old spiritual that sums it up. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. If Jesus knows, then what, that is what matters most of all. He knows where to tap our hearts and minds. Only Jesus can enable us to grow up and tackle the times of trouble so we will experience and triumph over them. Do you see the difference? It's very clear. We can waste our suffering, or we can allow it to produce steadfastness and faith. And we can allow that steadfastness, steadfastness and faith to produce perfect and complete in us, leaving us lacking in nothing. So the shout of joy, the shout of James is real. Consider it pure joy. And we can do that if we know that growth is not easy. If we realize that when we are suffering, it doesn't help to compare ourselves to others. And if we will not waste our suffering, but allow it to be steadfastness in faith, to learn that which things bring us to completion, we are lacking in nothing. I think that's a rather good lesson of practical Christianity, don't you? And it helps us to bring up, be the person that God calls each and every one of us to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you all.